Welcome to our next installment of Know Your O's on BaltimoreBaseball.com. This is Dan Connolly, and I am here with Caleb Joseph, Orioles catcher, and uh, some of his teammates will tell you Orioles class clown as well. So uh, I'm going to talk to him a little bit about some of the fun things he's done and, and get to know him a little bit better. But the first time I had a chance to talk to Caleb was back in 2009 when one of the uh, guys in the Orioles system told me, tipped me about a guy in Frederick who was sleeping in the clubhouse because he loved baseball so much. Um, so I contacted this kid and talked to him a little bit, and uh, that interview always stuck with me. So you slept in the clubhouse, huh? Yeah, it was, times were tough back then. We were <laughs> staying with probably three or four different guys in an apartment with no furniture, blow-up mattresses, and I remember the main reason I was doing it was because they had internet and cable at the field. And so uh, would just end up hanging out there late at night and would end up staying there watching TV. And by the time everybody had left, you know, there was the other clubby in there. And I would help him clean, you know, shoes and, and do some wash and whatnot. But um, when, it, when it got time to really uh, hit the sack, I said, you know, I'm just going to take it, you know, take a quick nap on the couch here sure enough it kind of started to stick and so uh, I ended up staying there and uh, then quickly got kind of booted out of there once some people found out they <laughs> saw it as a liability you could understand so it was uh, it was fun while it lasted for sure now those clubby duties or, or clubhouse attendant duties something that you actually come at a little bit naturally there because you did that with the Nashville Sounds uh, back when you were in high school. So talk about, I mean, you're the majors now, but back in the day, you were actually a clubhouse attendant. Yes, I was. I was in AAA Nashville. Uh, it was the Brewers for one year and, and the Pirates for one year. So the Pirates had had a long-standing relationship with uh, the city of Nashville, and then the Brewers came in for one year. But ironically, um, not many people know this, but ironically, I actually cleaned Adam Jones's cleats and, and uh, did his laundry and fixed his pregame spreads when he was with Tacoma uh, with the Mariners system a long time ago. And there have been uh, various other guys that I've run into in the big leagues that um, I have remembered cleaning their cleats back when I was in high school when they were already in, in professional baseball. Uh, it, was, it was something that I really cherished. I enjoyed it. I, I liked understanding and seeing that part of the game because that's all I wanted to do as a high schooler, as a ball player, just to play pro ball. And then you get a, a taste of that as a youngster without even really um, being drafted yet. You kind of understand how they go about their business and all that kind of stuff. And for me, that was uh, it was just something that I really enjoyed doing. Does Jones know that? Have you told him that? Oh, yeah. And he reminds me a lot, too. Sometimes <laughs> on these uh, muddy games, you know, he'll come to me and say, hey, clean my cleats, rookie, you know. So, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, let it go down. What were the other reactions you got from some of the guys that you went up to and told, hey, I was your, uh, I was the clubby in, in Nashville? Yeah, a couple of them. I've tried doing it when at, at, the, at home plate as they're walking up to, <laughs> to bat. And now you're trying to tell a, probably a 30-second story in two, um, but a lot of them probably didn't recognize me. But uh, some of them have recognized me, and it's like, oh, my goodness, you were that shaggy-haired blonde, you know, that was running around doing, yeah, that was me. and, and it's kind of weird to see it come full circle because it makes them obviously feel older because right. <laughs> it seems like forever ago. I mean, that was 2004 and five, right. Uh, right as I was graduating high school. I remember in 2001 when Brian Roberts came up, he was actually the bat boy at UNC when BJ Serhoff was a player there. Wow. So when I pointed that out to BJ, he was, you know, BJ and his very dull, uh, very dry sense of humor, <laughs> told me to, to go somewhere else with oh, that information. Yeah. He does, <laughs> but, yeah. BJ, he's a, he's a cool cat. But uh, now, you got a chance to, to debut in 2014, and I mean, it's your story has always been one of the ones that's intrigued me because of what you went through, all the years you put in. Um, what was it like to finally debut in the major leagues after all those years in the minors? Pretty unbelievable. Obviously, a dream come true. There had been so many moments of uh, uncertainty whether or not this was going to ever happen, and you just keep dreaming harder and harder as you get closer, and then maybe it doesn't work out, um, or at least not in your timing. And then once it really does happen, there's just this, uh, I don't know, maybe a euphoric 
feeling that just surrounds you when you actually make it, uh, that all of that work that you were doing finally comes to fruition, that you can enjoy it. It's, it is one of the most amazing feelings. And then you go through a period, I think, at least in my opinion, where it, it then becomes a job. Like, you know, you get through the uh, honeymoon phase, I guess, and now, you know, it's, it's obviously super serious and, and it's, it's no different than any other job. Now, don't get me wrong, it's, in my opinion, the best job ever, but, you know, there are duties and there are stresses and there are um, requirements that you want to be able to do. So early on, it's, it's just uh, like a kid in a candy store, and then as you move on, it becomes uh, super um, serious. Like, you, you want to win every game, and, and you understand that winning is the ultimate thing here. And that's tough because early on in your minor league career, you can tell that it's more of a selfish type of game because guys are moving up and down at various times. And so once you get to the big leagues, it's almost like reverting back to a college-style game that every win matters no matter whether you you do well or not, or, the, or uh, as long as the team wins, that's the most important thing. And so it becomes a, it becomes pretty serious really quickly. Now you spent four years in Bowie, uh, your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, if you will, in Bowie, basically, and you are the all-time games played leader in Bowie. That's a big deal down there, and they have a special locker and everything else for you. But that might come to pass. Garibaldi Rosa is six games away from you right now, or eight games away from you right now. Um, as we record this, um, and so he may end up breaking you as the as the Crash Davis of Bowie, if you will. Um, what's your thoughts there? And have you tried to get Rosa promoted or demoted? Absolutely, I've I've been trying to get him promoted, demoted, whatever for the last <laughs> month now. I've been in Showalter's ear trying to get him to Norfolk. Um, you know, they say records are meant to be broken, but in my opinion, this one isn't supposed to be broken. I mean. <laughs> You know, not this quick, too. Uh, the record was for some, like, uh, maybe 20 years or so. It, I could be wrong about that. You may have to check that. But And then, you know, the funny thing is I played with Rosa. So um, I can appreciate, I mean, he has a kind of a similar story, just uh, being in double-A, producing, playing pretty well, and then, you know, having just very sporadic chances at the next level and then continuing to go back down and play really well. And so... You know, if there is one guy that's going to break it and, and Garibaldi is the guy, then I can totally respect that because I know his story and because I actually play with him. So, but yeah, it is it, that that record is super important to me and, and meaningful to me because that was that those that was four hundred something games that that you know I was constantly thinking, is this ever going to work out? Is this ever going to happen? Because year after year after year, you keep going back to the same place. It's one thing to be moving places. But to keep going back to the same stop, that's when your hope starts to diminish a little bit. 434 games, and you had to pad that this year with your rehab assignment. Exactly, yeah. I got the opportunity to, to add, I think, six games to that. So I guess technically we should be tied if it, if it wasn't for that rehab stint. I'm thinking it's time for another rehab stint, you know, <laughs> go back down and pad some more. Um, we'll have to see what we can work out. But it's, uh, it, it, was a, it was a good run there. I mean, think about it, that, that 400 and something games, that was just the games I played. So if you really, I mean, there's probably closer to 700 if you count like all the games I didn't play. That's, that's, that's crazy if you think about it. Now, some of the guys here, when I ask them who the class clown of the Orioles and stuff, your name inevitably comes up. Um, one of the wittiest guys, and you have a lot of fun with stuff. You do some impressions, which you're not going to do here because you want to keep your job. So we're uh, we're not going to ask you to do that and get you get you demoted down to, to Frederick. Yeah. But um, you did. The, the Orioles have on, under Buck Showalter have always had a uh, talent show in March uh, at spring training. And you went up there and you basically put on a comedy routine, basically did a bunch of impressions. Um, tell us a little bit about that because it's kind of legendary in, in Orioles lore. Sure. So I'll set it up. I had played 2013 in Bowie and had the best year that I had had there and went and played winter ball in Venezuela. Did pretty well there and I'm feeling good about coming into spring training. And I just told myself, look, if this is going to be it. If they assign me back to Double A, then I'm just probably going to stay on I-65 and go just home instead of going up the, the East Coast to Bowie. I'm probably just going to go home, quit, retire, call it quits. So I went down to the spring training thinking, okay, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Absolutely, this is it. And so I get invited to Major League Camp, and they have me listed as a volunteer. Well, 
as a write-in for the talent show. And so I'm thinking and thinking, and this is becoming more uh, nerve-wracking as I think, what should I do, what should I do? And then it just became apparent that everybody wanted me to do the impressions because every once in a while, maybe during stretch or something, I would actually do uh, an impression uh, just to kind of liven it up. And it worked, and people enjoyed it. So I said, you know what, I'm just gonna go all out, and if they hate it, I'm pretty much in the same position I am already. If they love it, it could be a huge hit. So I impersonated quite a few of the staff here. Such as? Um, I've impersonated John Russell, Buck Showalter, Wayne Kirby. I've done pretty much every staff member uh, that has put an oil uniform on. And the big key was that first year, um, I, I was just kind of going on and on and on. and was rotating people and so at the very end you know they didn't know how many people I, I was gonna do so at the very end um, I came out and said okay guys like that's it uh, I'm done with the impressions I had done probably six and I was getting a great response a lot of laughs um, people were actually like falling out of their chairs they thought it was so funny and I was still like nervous because you don't truly know how somebody's gonna you know accept it and I said okay guys that's it I'm done Appreciate it, and I'm gonna go ahead and pack my bags, and I'll see you guys at Twin Lakes Park if you ever need me. Thinking that, you know, I've just like basically burned every one of these staff members who I have not played for and who barely really know me, and just went on a limb and just burned them, and uh, it ended up going uh, over well. And and that's kind of been I'm not gonna say my mo of this team, but. Um, I think people do appreciate the fact that I can kind of spice it up and, and keep it loose. There's always a time and a place to be serious, but you know, jokes here and there can uh, can really uh, loosen the clubhouse up. One of the ones that sticks with me is it was a very tense time last April, um, and yeah, there was a no fans game, and you came out and you signed fake autographs to people who weren't their imaginary people, and high five the imaginary fans on your way out. Um, and guys just you know lost it. There was one video, and people had it and stuff. Um, that to me is probably my favorite Caleb Joseph, you know, skit, if you will. Is there a Caleb Joseph greatest hits? Is there's one that 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 you've done that you know that you're especially proud of? Uh, I mean, that one definitely got the most exposure. The uh, no fans in the stadium, and initially, I didn't even really think that there were, were cameras. I, I knew obviously that there's probably going to be televised for the game, but it wasn't something I had pre-planned that I went out there. It was something as soon as I stepped out of the dugout, it just kind of, I was so used to being asked for an autograph or being that it was, I could, I was kind of playing it out in my head. And so of course, like I just kind of started impersonating and, and acting and cameras caught it and it was completely intentional, um, unintentional in, in terms of trying to do something funny. But and it wasn't. I wasn't trying to be insensitive by any means right. to the situation at all. And so there was kind of a, a backlash there a little bit. But uh, that took over and that went viral. And you know, we we had a really nice season. And a lot of people. That's the first thing they wanted to talk to me about. So I, I fielded probably hundreds of questions about that. Like, what what were you thinking? What were you? And so that was the most. Uh, ask question that I had last year for sure that's probably the number one thing that, that um, I've done that has gotten a little bit of exposure Now, one thing about you that people may not know you grew up around Nashville you spent a lot of time in Nashville you live in Nashville now um, and you are a huge hockey fan which you know not only I mean obviously the Predators are there now but you don't really think of Tennessee as a, as a hotbed for hockey but you love it and you told me you're, you're almost like a goofy fan when you go to the games you're, you're pretty much a season ticket holder you're there all the time um, what's that like and where did that love for hockey and, and how goofy do you get at games? Yeah, it's it's embarrassing sometimes. I, I'm the guy that has the, the jersey and the hat and the, I haven't gone as far as to get a foam finger yet, but um, I do have multiple jerseys of my favorite players. Um, but it started when I was really young and my brother and I and some of the neighborhood kids, we would play roller hockey every day and we had little portable goals. We run out and uh, when a car came we shift them over just like normal kids do and that kind of led up into about high school and then the Predators showed up in uh, in Nashville and it just kind of took off the sport has slowly began to grow uh, throughout the entire city we've got rinks kind of all over and 
I've become a huge hockey fan. I actually was at the very first Predators game, and I've been to probably six to eight at least games a year. At the high end, I've been to like 35 out of the, <laughs> what, 42 or something. Um, so I, I'm a huge hockey fan, and I, I tell people all the time, there's really like three reasons that I'm playing Major League Baseball. One is so that I can afford season tickets for the Predators. Two is for a Dippin' Dots machine, my own personal Dippin' Dots machine. And three is to uh, pay for my kids' college. So like those are pretty much the three biggies, but the number one is definitely uh, season tickets for the Predators. Uh, the game is so fast, I just enjoy it. Um, I love being there live. Um, and it doesn't hurt that Gary Thorne, you know, our announcer here, I mean, he, he, he was doing NHL games, I think was it uh, NBC or even ESPN on Sundays and stuff, and so uh, that was a great connection. But yeah, huge hockey fan. If I had to pick one sport uh, instead of baseball, it would definitely be hockey. Now, as a Nashville guy, i got to ask you a little music real quick. Um, you play the drums. Tell us a little bit about that. And if you put together an Orioles band, you got Trumbo playing guitar, maybe even uh, Absolutely. Uh, Ricker playing uh, keyboards. He's learning that. Sure. Um, who's your front man? Who's the Orioles front man? He, he, Trumbo said he would put Don Cheedy because he can rock it out. But uh, but who would be uh, who would be the Orioles front man in the Caleb uh, Caleb Joseph drumming band? I'll tell you what, um, Chaz Rowe looks the part. He looks <laughs> he the does. part, right? Everything about Chaz Rowe looks the part, and sometimes that's all it takes is the look. Um, yeah, that would have to be my answer. Trumbo would definitely be a part. Chidi could definitely, but I mean, I'm gonna be on the skins for sure, no doubt about that. My wife actually just got me a. Uh, nice set of electric drums hmm. for my birthday and the funniest thing about this is my son walker we're trying to figure out which hand he plays with like are you going to be a right-handed thrower or what like we're still unsure he's 15 months old and we walk in and a couple days after i've set up this drum set he starts walking in when he wakes up and he wants to get on the drum set so he grabs both sticks in each hand properly and waits on the little seat and I pick him up and put him on the seat and he starts you know banging on the drums and it we may have a little rocker here you know it may not matter what hand he's gonna throw with or swing with because he may be using both using drumsticks but I've always loved the drums uh, I've never really taken lessons but I'm one of those that can hear it of course like with my impersonation background I've, if I can watch somebody do something and if I can hear it then I could usually make it sound and, and look the same and it's worked so far.